Sham and Erica, how are y'all today? <laughs> good. Doing I'll good. be more professional, Shaman and <laughs> James. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you both um, so much for joining me today uh, on my passion project um, on this podcast called Panic and Patience. And really, the whole premise of Panic and Patience is really to highlight um, change agents and community organizers and, and leaders in our community to really express how. Um, a lot of us who are trying to make the world a better place are constantly in conflict with these two um, sort of um, ideas of the sense of urgency that things have to, things should happen immediately, right? The change needs to happen, policies needs to change, justice needs to be had, but also understanding that this work takes time. You know, um, nothing happens overnight and there's power and resilience in, in doing something that you understand, may, you may not be able to see the fruits of your labor for maybe until the next generation, maybe our children or grandchildren may be able to, to, wit, to, to bear witness to the work that we're doing today. And um, having you both um, a part of this conversation is incredibly um, humbling for me um, as I go on this journey and trying to learn and understand different perspectives, but also um, give the audience a perspective that they may not have had. So I appreciate you both so much for, um, for your time and willingness to have this conversation with me today. Yeah, thank you for having us, man. Much appreciated. Happy to do no it. Um, and so uh, I like to start off my podcast with uh, sort of an icebreaker. Um, if I was to ask you to tell me a story today, what, what, would, you, what would you tell me? Well, funny you say that because I was thinking about, you know, what story am I going to tell? And up until this very moment, I was going to talk about, you know, friendship. Like you and I, we've been friends for almost 30 years, as crazy as that sounds, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was thinking about the impact of your friends and your circle on your life and what decisions and which direction they drive you in or how they help you or push you or pull you in certain directions. But, you know, in your intro, you, you made a great point about having, you know, patience. And something that I, I was dealing with the last couple of days was we had our, our community conversations on Saturday. And I was extremely discouraged by the low turnout of black men on the call. We had roughly 30 people on the call and it was 90% white. So like, we're trying to bring two worlds together, you know, black men, black women, white, white women, white men, and have this open dialogue. And I was very, very discouraged. And I was like, you know, it makes me just want to stop. Like, like, why am I doing this if I can't even get my my team or my inner circle to show through and have these very valuable conversations? So your point about, you know, having patience that you may not see the fruits of your labor for like years or even the next generation, like that was, like that hit home for me because I'm thinking about it like, oh, do I just quit? Do I just give up? Why am I even doing this? Because, you know, people don't care. You know, you're not stuck in your house. People can go out and have fun. So why do people want to join our conversations? And you're 100% you're, you're right. Like, if we're going to do this work, if we're going to try to make change, there are going to be trials, there are going to be tribulations, there are going to be stumbling points, and we just have to keep pushing. It's like, if I quit now, like, what does that mean? Like, we have a community, we have probably, you know, 30 so people who are continually showing out. Like, what does that mean for them if we stop? Because they're looking at us like, okay, you're bringing people together. They're doing the work. They're doing the reading. They're doing the learning. They're engaging their other, their other friends and family members. And we need to keep it pushing. So the patience thing that you bring up is, it, it's really hitting home for me right now because we do need to keep pushing because change is not going to happen overnight. We, we, we really need to continue to do the work and continue pushing. Even if we have five people in the conversation, that's a, a message that those five people may hear that they might not have heard if we didn't have the, the meeting or the forum. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and to that point, um, especially for us, Shimon, like what if our ancestors gave up? Yeah. Right? Like what if they said like, you know what? I'm just gonna be a slave. And yep. it's just, that's just what it is. What if Harry was just like, you know? And so that's, yep. that's, that's, a, that's what keeps me going. And that's what keeps a lot mm -hmm. of us, you know, keeping it pushing is because, yo, they didn't give up on us. And we're able to, even though there's still a lot of change that needs to happen, we have it much easier than yep. those who came before us. And, you know, this work is to make those who come after us lives not easy, but easier. Because exactly. there's always going to be some sort of challenge, some sort of struggle that comes along with life. But if we can make the path and the journey easier, then, we're, then, then we've done our job, you know, while we were here. 
Yep. Um, so um, you talked about, you know, having 30 people in your community conversation. What, what, what was, what's the story behind that? How did that start? And, and, and how is it from the time that you first had the conversation to, to what it is today? What have you learned from it? You want me to take that? Uh, okay. Okay, good. Uh, so, you know, we, we've been having these conversations kind of between ourselves and with um, his kids to the extent that we can and that they're able to wrap their heads around it. But we have these conversations all the time. Um, and, you know, he'd have friends over. I talked to my friends about, about the issues and it was like an echo chamber. Mm -hmm. um, and cause we're all pretty much on the same page with slight variances here and there. And so one night we were just talking and like, why don't we open this up? Why don't we make it more of a forum so that we can start having these conversations with people who might not have them otherwise. So, you know, I'm thinking my, my girlfriends, I'm from a tiny town in Western mass. There's like pretty much only white people who, who live there. That's where my high school was. Mm -hmm. Um, and not, it's not often that you would encounter a conversation like that. Um, even now. Um, so in thinking about kind of your circle of friends and that my friends wouldn't ever really interact, not not for any kind of fear, but just that the worlds never collide, mm -hmm. except for at our 4th of July party. <laughs> um, so, you know, opening it up um, to have like a really um, more structured and constructive dialogue where people can speak and speak freely. So that that's kind of how it started. Okay, and and so what what is the what is the vibe like when you guys come together? Is it more or less is it is it structured in a sense where you have an agenda and you have these different topics that you're talking about, or is it more or less you know um, organic and as things come up, people talk about the different experiences they're having, whether it's at home or in their personal life. What 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 is it what does it look and feel like once you do? Because I'm assuming it's virtual at this point, right? Um, and and so how how does it look and feel once you guys engage in those types of conversations? Yeah. So it's it's kind of a little bit of both. So mm -hmm. you know. Sham has been really good about kind of bringing my type A personality <laughs> down to earth because I want like everything to be structured and, and have, you know, an agenda and all of that. But he's, it's been really good to, to have our two kind of personalities working together there. So there's generally a topic or two that we re suggest in the invitation um, that we want to touch on and we'll provide um, some resources that might be helpful, but they're not homework. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, you know, we'll, we'll, talk usually a few minutes beforehand about how we want to kick it off and then just kind of let it go from there. Um, you know, we'll, we'll start the conversation and, you know, rein it in if we need to um, and allow like conversations to go forward um, or move on to the next topic. So, um, but really we're just facilitating. Mm -hmm. um, we don't see it as like a lecture or anything like that. It's, we're just the conveners. Okay. okay. It's not our conversation, but it's our conversation. So it's everybody's conversation. So initially we'll we'll let people know like it's a it's a safe space. Like you're you're not going to be vilified if you say something that people don't agree with, but we want people to feel encouraged to speak out and share their perspective, share their experiences. Like we all know that everybody's at a different place in their journey. Some people like being frank, some white people had no idea these types of things were going on. Like even in 2020, and you'd be shocked where people had no idea that black people were still treated unfairly or that racism was still a thing. So we have some people who are just brand new. And when they saw what they saw with George Floyd, like that's their first introduction into some of the atrocities that black and brown people face on a daily basis. You know, other people have been aware, but they've been, you know, kind of staying back. Others have been doing the work. So it's, we know that everybody's not in the same place. And then you have the, you know, the blacks on the call. Like we've lived it. We had those years of experience where we get it. We understand what's happening to our people day in and day out. So we have those experiences that we want to share with some of the people. Uh, I've been learning, you know, I, I, it's been very helpful to hear some of the perspectives of some of the, the white guests because I've never had that view into the, the life or the mind of a white person. 
because mm -hmm. I grew up as a black man in America. So our perspectives are completely different. So it's, ve it's been ve very valuable for me to understand why a person may think the way they do or why someone hasn't been you know, more aware or, or why they're choosing to remove the blinders now. So it, it's really good as far as hearing and sharing and learning. And there's a lot of that going on. It's been a very safe space. Mm -hmm. Like there, nothing's been you know, contentious at all. People are just really there to learn and share, and it's been really great. And and why do you think that this conversation is happening now, though? Because the, you know, I, George Floyd's situation is not something that's new, right? You know, racism in America is not something that's new, um, uh, unfortunately. And so, why do you think that folks are actually open to having this conversation now? Like, why didn't this happen in you know July of 2019 July 2018 like why you know why are these things happening now is it do you think it's because people are are have to be still and have to be home well, what's your thoughts that's a great question and i think it's a combination of a bunch of things one mm -hmm. there's nothing else going on there's no sports there are no other distractions people are stuck in the house and you know frankly the media needed something to talk about and it's been you know, shoved in everybody's faces every day since it happened. And then the brutal nature of the way he was killed, that was kind of a shock, you know, a shock factor too. It's like, mm -hmm. all right, you you had a, a police officer who's supposed to protect and serve, keep his knee on a person's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Like that's, you know, people just mm -hmm. are initially just shocked. Like, wow, that's that's terrible. So you, you bring all of those things together and you have the perfect storm where people are really willing and, open to learning and seeing what you know the black and brown people go through on a daily basis and mm -hmm. to take that a step further now as we're starting to open a little bit you can start to see some of the interest waning a bit because there are there are more distractions now and this thing isn't as important but as we know this has been going on forever like we mm -hmm. have to keep pushing so that, that's my take on it actually yeah i think Definitely all of that. <laughs> um, but I also think that because it was so um, public and like you said, the brutal nature in which he was killed um, and then kind of, it was also in a long series of um, both police killings, but also, or killings by police, but also just brutal murders of black people, plain and simple. I think that it was a point where no one could look away anymore. Like you, you can't, and, and when I say no one, I mean most white folks. Like if you were being willfully ignorant um, and turning a blind eye to it up until now, you had no excuse anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and you were forced to confront it. Um, and so I think that that was a huge contributing factor to kind of why this time feels different. Yeah. Um, and that I think people were willing to put themselves out there to ask for resources to say, I don't know this. Can you help me? Mm -hmm. um, usually at the cost of their black and brown friends, something maybe we can talk about later. Yeah. Um, but, but at least willing to say, like, I don't know this. I, I need to learn. Okay, and 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 let's let's talk about the elephant in in the room. It's obvious that you guys are an interracial couple. How has that impacted how you one deal with each other in this? Because the way Shimon, the way you consume media and the way you consuming the George Floyd death is very different than how you would consume it, Erica. Right, like. Unfortunately, Shame, I'm sure you probably said to yourself, we've seen this before. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's sad, but it's not a shock. Mm -hmm. Erica, maybe it might have been a shock for you. And how has that, how is the relationship between you and, and, and Shimon, how have you guys come together throughout all of this? Because a lot of folks may seem, may feel Erica, it's, it's convenient for you to be like Black Lives Matter. Your, your, your partner's black, right? Like say, uh -huh. say, say he wasn't, say he was white. Would you be talking about Black Lives Matter if he wasn't, right? Yeah. And so how, how has this affected your relationship um, and, and the growth of, of learning about, you know, social justice um, in America today? Yeah, so I think, you know, I 
I've been Black Lives Matter since Black Lives Matter first became a hashtag, mm -hmm. but that's, it's also not about me. So I, I think that I've been involved, I've been involved in social justice work for a really, really long time, mm -hmm. whether it's LGBT issues um, or race issues or um, gender issues. So it's something that I've worked on for a long time, but I can absolutely understand why someone who maybe doesn't know us and doesn't know our my background specifically would say like, oh, that's really convenient. If she was dating a white man, maybe that's not, maybe she would just be willfully blind. Right. Um, right. I can say that that's not the case at all. Um, and you can attest to that. You knew when you met me that that was, you know, kind of where, where my head has always been. Um, but I think that, that that question, when I initially kind of looked at it, <clears throat> really raised for me some feelings about what I've heard from you and from some of your friends about like the general mistrust of white people, even though it feels different this time around. Mm -hmm. And like, why is it different? And why are they all of a sudden now, they, why are we all of a sudden now um, paying attention and doing something about it? So I thought that was a really interesting question to me about kind of, you know, how, how has it impacted your relationship? And basically, like, are you just now coming to this space to realize it? And I know that there are others who are just finally coming to the space to realize it. But I think for us, the way that it's impacted our relationship is that I, I struggle because I know I can never understand. Like there's just no way I will ever truly understand how he either consumes the the media about it or what his what is the impact his daily life. Mm -hmm. There's no way I can ever understand that. And like as his partner, that sucks. <laughs> Cause I want to be able to say, like, yeah, I hear you. Like, let's let's figure this out. What can we do? Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. And so in a way, I think that that's part of how community conversations evolved out of that, because there's, I'll say it again, there's no way I can ever understand what, mm -hmm. what that experience is like. Um, so I think in a strange way that it has given us a, a common purpose um, and that we've been kind of plowing forward together on it. So yeah, let me add to that. So when we first met, um, she was going to a Black Lives Matter protest and it was all over the news and I was like worried for her safety because you know there were so some of the um, the, the far right people who were expected to be oh, there yeah. and <laughs> it was it was there's a potential that it could get ugly so at this point we you know had been talking for a, a week maybe two weeks and you know she has her Black Lives Matter shirt on so like she's been doing this work you know way before I came into the picture and that's mm -hmm. one thing that I appreciate and the fact that she understands that she can never fully understand, like that helps me out because I don't feel like she's trying to, in a sense, mansplain what I'm going through. So she mm -hmm. can just sit back and say, okay, like I get it. This is my perspective on it. A couple of times we had conversations where I talked about, you know, our black skin is a weapon and she initially didn't get that. So she was like, you know, maybe it's a threat. And I'm like, no, like these white people will take our black and brown skin as a weapon that gives them justification in their mind to treat us as less than because we inherently have this weapon that we can't take off so mm -hmm. we had conversations around things like that and like she's 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 super open to you know hearing my perspective because like she knows i have to live it um as an example um you know bc before corona i was driving home from work um for my corporate america job and my you know my fancy expensive car or whatever you know and I got pulled over by the police. You know, I'm college educated. Uh, you know, I'm a family man. I work in corporate America. I check all the societal boxes. Yet I get pulled over and I text her and she's immediately fearful for my life. Mm -hmm. Most white women or my, uh, white people wouldn't understand that dynamic when a black man is faced with being pulled over on a routine stop that that could be their last, their last day on this earth. Mm -hmm. like she got it she she freaked out but she she understood like from my perspective that this is not a routine stop you know this this routine stop could turn ugly really quickly so mm -hmm. i can appreciate those types of things from her 
Like she doesn't try to mansplain it away. She doesn't say, oh, you know, you're getting pulled over, no biggie. She really understands that, hey, this could be a bad thing. Like she, she refused to text me back after I got pulled over because she didn't want me reaching for my phone and a police officer to think I was reaching for a gun or something. So mm-hmm. just having that wherewithal really helps us out in our relationships. So I don't have to explain everything to her. There are things that, you know, we do discuss that I have to explain and give her my perspective and she gives me hers. But, you know, for the most part, like she understands our plight. Mm-hmm. And is and, and and you both can chime in on this. Is when you talk about each other's perspectives, um, do you guys walk into the th- to the conversation whether like if we're talking about black issues, Sh- Shimon, you're always right. You know, if we're if we're in, 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 and Erica, your opinion is always wrong because you don't get it. Like how is how is that like? How, how open are you to to really like hearing and 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 learning throughout the process? Because you know. Shimon, I know you're not always right, even though there's this pain, there's trauma, there's things that that she will never understand. Sometimes, sometimes we we're not always we don't got it all figured out. You know, we don't, you know, our anger can sometimes, you know, supersede logic and strategy. Yep. And and uh-huh. you, you know, and, and yep. Erica, for, for you the same thing. Like how how is that like for, for for you both when you're having these, you know, emotional moments um centered around race? And trying to not only learn each other, but learn what's actually happening outside your walls of your of the comfort of your home. Yeah, sure. Well, one thing I like to say to Erica is, like, I'm not looking for you know right or wrong all the time. Like, I I don't want I don't want to be right. You know, it, it it's not a matter of right versus wrong all the time. You yeah. know, it's like we're if we're having an intelligent conversation or intelligent dialogue, let's just have the conversation. It's not like I'm right, you're wrong. Shut up. You know, I'm black, I live this, you're white, you can't know. It's like, let me hear what you have to say. Let's maybe come to a common understanding. But is, I I try not to say, oh, I'm right, Erica, because I'm black and you're wrong because you're white because you just won't understand because I like to hear where she's coming from because mm-hmm. I know that I don't have all the answers. Like you just said, there's a ton for me to learn and just hearing from her side of it, it could open my eyes to something that I haven't considered. Uh, one of the conversations we had where we first started talking about the community conversations, uh, she wanted white people to shut up and listen. And I was like, no, I don't think that's going to be, you know, very ben- beneficial because I want to hear their perspective. You know, it was like when you're, when you're talking about such a complex issue, you know, having a right or wrong doesn't really solve the problem. When we're trying to get to a point of understanding, growing and then moving forward saying i'm wrong you're right or vice versa like who who is that really helping right right i think from my end it's yes knowing that maybe he won't always be right about whatever it is that we're talking about but that is his truth and that there there can be two truths that exist simultaneously um and whatever it is that he's telling me is his experience and his truth and that I need to be open to receiving that. I think that that's generally the nature of our relationship anyway. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, going back to your comment about whether your skin is a weapon or a threat, like that's something for me that I, I really struggled to wrap my head around um, because I wasn't thinking about it as someone's body being weaponized, even though there wasn't anything dangerous about a person's skin. And Mm -hmm. I couldn't wrap my head around that. And so it took me like a day or two and some reading to really let it sink in and to think about it and come back with some help from him being like, that's what I said. (laughs) And being like, yeah, yeah, I I get it. I I get it as much as I can get it. I get it. Um, But it wasn't a contentious conversation either. Mm. It was just kind of like, I don't really see it that way. Here's why I don't see it that way. And he would explain, here's why I feel that way. And just kind of hearing each other out, but also knowing in that situation that if he says his skin is seen as a weapon, that is his truth. That is what it is. End Mm. of story. Um, And I also like, really like what you said um, about, listening and, and, and accepting his truth, but also reading. Uh, can, mm-hmm. can you tell me a little bit about that? Like, what what are you reading? Um, was it something that, 
that Shimon had said, hey, like, read this because this is really, I, I don't have the words for it, but this explains what, what I'm talking about. Or did you take it upon yourself to, to find some things? And if so, what, what were those things for those who may be looking for resources to, to try to um, indulge in? Yeah, so I think on that particular topic, it was, it kind of came up in the news, I think. So it was on. Um, mm -hmm. And then we, I don't remember what article it was, but I think that we were, or maybe it was an Instagram post or something like that, but it was something that we kind of stumbled upon. Mm -hmm. um, you sent it to me or I sent it to you. I, I, I don't really remember that part of it. Um, but it just, it kind of came up organically because there have actually been a lot of things lately that, mm -hmm. that he was like, see, I said that. And it's someone famous on, on TV saying that's the validation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so, so that's helpful. I have been reading a lot and, um, you know, would just like to point out that reading doesn't make you anti-racist. You actually have to do the <laughs> daily work, but yeah. um, there's, I've, I've been doing a lot of reading over the course of several years on, on race issues. So one of the things I think that I always tell fellow white people to start with is white fragility mm -hmm. and stamped from the beginning as like a, um, a foundation. I think that those two are good foundations to kind of move forward. And that book that you have right next to you there. <laughs> How to be an anti-racist. Yeah. Um, one, one of my favorite books in this in this season. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Shamar, what would you say is for those? Because I feel like it, you, a lot of us talk about unity and talk about love in this in this season, in in, in this turmoil, in the cultural political climate, right? And then th there, after you talk about love and unity, you'll then talk about you know or you'll judge those who are in interracial relationships, right? You know, those who would be like, you know, Jamar, you're a hypocrite. You talk about Black Lives Matter and your, and your partner is white, right? And, 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 and Erica, maybe similar conversations with your circle. Like, would, Shamar, what would you say for, for those who would say like you're a hypocrite if you're, you know, so um, passionate about talking about this, this, um, these issues, but then go home to someone who doesn't get it? to go home to someone who has not experienced what you've experienced and, 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 and how, how has that, you know, impacted your life personally? Well, I, I think it's very short sighted to say someone is being a hypocrite for saying that black lives matter and they're in an interracial relationship. I, I don't mm -hmm. see how those two are, you know, impacting one another. Like at the end of the day, I'm black, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> my, my mother's black, my father's black, my children are black. So I care about all those people, all of my close friends, they're black. I have white friends too that are, I'm very close with. I don't think that me saying that black lives matter and me dating a white woman should matter at all because I still care about black people and I still care about the growth and progression of our people. It doesn't matter who I go home to, a, you know, at night. Like, yes, I can, you know, love a white woman and still love my people. There's not saying you can only love your people or you can only love white people or white women like that. I think that is just so short-sighted to say that. I, mm -hmm. I, I can kind of understand where people are coming from. You know, you're thinking about, you know, black unity and, you know, black love. And like, I understand it. But to say that you can't be for Black Lives Matter and for the empowerment of black people, yet date a white woman, I, I just can't get behind that. And I would say to them, like, that's very, very narrow-minded because you're striving for black people to be equal but then you're saying you can only be equal if you're with a black partner because if not you're a sellout uh, to me I, I just can't get behind that so like what kind of equality do you, do you really want like mm -hmm. do you just kind of want separate but equal do we want to go back to that where hey you know blacks only at that water fountain you know there's there's mm -hmm. no no interbreeding like i i just can't get behind that at all mm -hmm. and 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 how important is allyship for you um Erica, like, because I think that, well, I don't think I know that we can't, we can't push forward unless we have voices that go beyond black people. That's just period. You know, we, we, we have to, you know, Asians have to get on, you know, Latinos, Latinx have to get on white people. Like we all, in order for this thing to actually have some significant change, like everybody needs to come together, but particularly white people simply because they're the ones in power. Right. Yep. And mm -hmm. so how important is that for, for you because it's right now it's convenient because your man, your pop, your partner is black, 
but also understanding that um, you, you talk about like willful ignorance and 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 that kind of stuff and 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 knowing like once you're outside nobody knows necessarily what you have at home right mm -hmm. and so you have a you can decide whether or not you can stand up and say something or not mm -hmm. so what's your thoughts on 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 um real allyship even when it is uncomfortable beyond your household because you know your your, your the, the color of, of the skin of your partner yeah i mean i think true allyship is i think it is my responsibility not as his white partner but as mm -hmm. a white person yeah. um irrespective of my relationship with him mm -hmm. um it is incumbent upon white people who acknowledge that these issues are happening because how can you not but acknowledging that these these things are happening around us it is our responsibility to call it out mm -hmm. to, to call it out to our white friends and family and to say no like that mm -hmm no, this is not how this is going to go. What you said is inappropriate. What you're doing is inappropriate. And here's why. Mm -hmm. And take on the role of calling it out and educating those folks, even if they could, they don't want to be educated at all. Like, mm -hmm. I don't care. <laughs> if you don't want to be educated, you're going to hear about it. And, and this is how it's going to happen. And I get that that's uncomfortable. And there are a lot of people who who don't know how to have those conversations. And I don't know that there's one particular formula to, to go by to make those uncomfortable conversations less uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but it is far more comfortable for a white person to call that out of another white person than it is, I would imagine, for a black person or another person of color to say, hey, white person in a traditionally um, power, structure um, don't do that and here's why I don't do that because I think that folks who would who do things like that are more likely to want to listen to a white person in a lot of ways and would say like oh you're pulling the race card or you know whatever so I think that it is like I said regardless of my relationship it is my responsibility to be not just an ally but to like put myself on the line my reputation what it, whatever it may be um, if I truly want to get to the, that same place of equity and equality that we're talking about, I have to be willing to put it on the line. Yeah, change isn't going to come without actual allies being white people. Like they're they're the majority; they're in a position of power. Like, and if it was truly just all black people, we know what would happen. Like, nothing would change because why? Why would you care about us? You know, like historically, things change when white people are involved. Right. You know, it's, if right. it's just us, it's like, you know, we're considered less than anyway, so wh wh why would they care? You know, just, right. a, just a couple of thugs or a, a couple of criminals, you know, just shaking the trees, you know, but when you start getting white people involved, then the situation and the, and the reality of it kind of hits home. Yeah, and, and, and the next thing I want to talk about is uh, parenting. And you know you have you have two children in the home, two beautiful children in the home. And Thank what you. is that? I know they're really young, so it, it can only go but so far. But um, what has that been like for for you and and, and having conversations with your children, um, particularly um, in this time? You know they they've been home from school for quite some time, and a lot has changed. You know from their their their, their day to day. How has it impacted? um you know them and you raising them and then having conversations around around race with um you know within your home well i, I try to keep my daughter out of it she's only three so i think she's a little too young but my mm -hmm. son he'll be uh nine in a couple of weeks we've had these conversations and they're very difficult when you're trying to explain something to an eight-year-old that shouldn't be it's very difficult to find the words because they're so innocent and in their mind is like, why does it matter if I have different color skin? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no shit. Like it, it really, like it really shouldn't. But right. I don't have an answer for that. Like how how can I answer him a, a question that no one's been able to solve for 400 plus years? So mm -hmm. children, they ask the very difficult questions because in their mind it shouldn't be a certain way. So it's been very difficult trying to explain to Braden, uh, who's an eight year old, how he has to move, how his beautiful brown skin 
is viewed by the masses. Like he just, he'll see his white friends like, oh, let's go play. But he doesn't understand, like if he's out with his friends and is him and five white guys, he's going to be the target. He's going to stand out. So an example, he's on a soccer team and like he, he's an eight year old boy. He likes to fool around like, like they all do. So like, I'll see him fooling around and he's the one that stands out. I'm like, Brayden, you have to be on your best behavior because if there's something that's happening, you're going to be the first one they see. All the I, for, for, hold on, sorry to cut you off for some reason I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. We, we yeah. lost our audio for a second. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so, so I, I, you heard at the point um, when you said, you know, you got to be on your best behavior. Yeah. So he, like, so if it's Braden hanging out, you know, at soccer with, you know, four white friends on week one and they're fooling around, mm-hmm. you know, the coach is going to remember Braden. Then the next week it's Braden, a different group of four, uh, four friends. Again, he's going to stick out. All the white kids, they kind of blend together, but you know that one constant. And mm-hmm. I tell Braden, like, when you're competing, like, it should be based on your merits. It should be a meritocracy, but it's not always the case. So I told him, if you're equal with someone, there's a chance that they may pick the white kid over you. And that's very difficult to try to explain to an eight-year-old. Like, Mm -hmm. I hope I'm not bringing, you know, my 39 years of experience and, you know, the burdens and the trials that I've gone through. I hope I'm not putting those on him, but that's the reality that he's going to have to face. So, Mm -hmm. you, you know, for black people to make it, you really have to be exceptional. Like you, you can't be average and make it because an average white man versus a very good black man, the average white man is going to win most times. So just trying to explain these things to him and then he'll come back with just like a, a duh question. I'm like, great. I don't know the answer to that. Like, mm-hmm. I, I don't know why you have to be exceptional just because you have brown skin. I don't know why if you're out with your white friends that you're going to be a target because mm-hmm. like, it doesn't make any sense. So these conversations are very difficult, but it's the same thing. You, you, you probably had to go through it too with your parents when they're mm-hmm. teaching you, if you get pulled over, you need to act a the certain talk, way. The talk, the it's talk, the talk, right? The talk. And, 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 and that's, you know, it's an interesting way to frame it because most, if you say to a white person, have you had to talk with your t- child? They're probably thinking sex. Exactly. 100%. Yep. Right. Yep. right? Exactly but, 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 but Dude, you, Shimon, you're not having a talk about sex with an eight-year-old, but you're no. having the talk. You're, you're, yep. and, and, and this is sort of the beginning of the talk, right? Because it, as he gets older, it's going to get deeper and deeper. And Erica, I want you to chime in on this because how are you supporting that, mm-hmm. that aspect of, of the talk? Because you, you are, you know, a parental figure. You're supplementing, you know, how these children are being raised and you're coming from a completely different lens. How, how has that impacted the way, you know, you support, um, you know, the, 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 the growth and the, the maintaining of the innocence of a child in the best, in the best way possible? Yeah, I think I'll be honest and say, I don't, I don't really know. So I just, I just wait. Cause like, I'm not, a mom myself. And so I've been winging it on lots of levels, but I think for me, it's been letting the kids know that they're loved and supported and strong and intelligent and just kind of at any turn I possibly can, letting them know that, letting them know they're valued. Um, That, you know, Sophie used to come home from preschool and be upset that her teacher couldn't do her hair in an Elsa braid because all the girls that she was in school with had long straight hair and her teacher couldn't do that for her Mm -hmm. and like reminding her that her hair is gorgeous the way that it is and she didn't need to do anything to it and we Mm -hmm. can do an Elsa braid just just like that don't worry about it we'll take care of it but Mm -hmm. just letting them know that they're loved and supported and letting Sham know that you know what, what do you need from me? Like, I'm, I'm here. Do you need a brain break? Like, you know, cause there's also, you know, the fatigue in that and constantly worrying about your own children, um, that you're not paying attention necessarily to kind of everything that's going on for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially in this time. And so just trying to 
you know, whatever kind of extra bandwidth I, I have, just trying to offer it up. Um, emotional bandwidth, I guess. Um, but like, it, it occurred to me, so he was sitting on the couch with Bray watching the news pretty early on after, after George Floyd's death. And um, I just saw him sitting there with his arm around Bray and trying to explain these really difficult questions that Brayden had where there is no logical answer for anything he asked and just feeling really overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I realized this is like, this is what black mothers feel every single day. Like, mm-hmm. this is, this is what black people feel every single day. And I'm just getting like an obstructed view seat of, and like a sliver of a glimpse of it mm-hmm. from like rose colored glasses. Like, mm-hmm. so like, to, like that, I think was, that was really powerful to me to just watch you with your son and thinking like, if I feel this way, the way you feel is like exponential. Yeah, and I remember that night vividly because I actually teared up because um, I'm watching this and, you know, that fear is, is real. You know, it's like, you know, Jay, you, you know, you have two kids, you, you get it. Like, it's mm-hmm. that fear that you have for your children. And, and T. Coates said it in his book, like, you know, you want to protect your children because of the fears you have. You know, mm-hmm. you know, when, when they step outside, it's a whole different story. Like, it's a whole different ball game. And that fear we have as parents, like, whether we're, we're going to beat them to make sure they listen, or we, we're going to be super hard on them to make sure they don't step out of line once they step out into that real world. It's, it's so true, and it's, it's inexplicable, but it's, that's the generational trauma that our people face, because like, we know what it's like. As you get older and you have more you know, experience in this world, like these fears that we have, white people don't have these fears. White people don't have to worry about stepping outside and running into an Amy Cooper in the park and having the police, you know, use as a weapon to take your life. Like, mm-hmm. like these fears, like, these are real things that we have to deal with. We have to deal with, you, you have a girl, you have to deal with her being a black woman, a young black woman in America. And you know young black women as a whole, bottom of the barrel. Mm-hmm. And it's very unfair. And it's like trying to raise them to be strong and to be powerful and to be confident. Like, these are fears that I don't believe the other races have to actually think about at a very deep level. Of course they care about their children. Of course they do. Like, I'd be silly to say they don't, but there's just an extra level of fear that we have to deal with as parents of having you know, black and brown children. Yeah, yeah we, I, I never I, was worried about me being an Italian girl out in the, <laughs> like, yeah. this is never a thing. Yeah, I definitely think, uh, particularly, you know, and, and for Sophie and, and, and for my daughter Jada, like, I, I, it's incredibly important for us to to be sort of uh, to overcompensate for them, especially because they are the most vulnerable um, population. Black Black women, uh, Black and Brown women are the most vulnerable population in all of this, and that's an incredibly, um, you know, discouraging and scary for me because it's just like, I think, I think my daughter is the most precious, beautiful thing on, on the planet, face of this earth, right? And to, yeah. to think, to think that any, like, I want to put her in like a bubble, like I want to put her in, some, you know, in, the, in, in, in shrink wrap just to protect her from everything. And so mm-hmm. but that, but that can't just, I can't just care about my child. Right. I got to care about the Sophies. I got to care about all the other black and brown women because they are the ones who birth us. Right. Yep. They're the ones that that, you know, that hold our families down, you know. And so, you know, I think that that's incredibly uh, uh, important for us to be having these conversations, especially with our young ladies and our, and our, and our young queens. And then. You know, like you said, the conversations with Brayden, like I, you know, my son, he, you know, he's seven. And so it's been really challenging. And I, I've had challenges um, because we have friends who are police officers. Yep. And, sure and, it, and it, like, he cannot fathom that cops are bad. Like he just, that's just, because we have friends who are like, no, well, Uncle so-and-so is not, in it. you know, and, and, and how do you explain, you know, that it's it's certain people but he's but he's looking at the uniform he's looking at the badge and it's just like that's their mom in their mind they are very you know monolithic in a sense but they're all they come in all different shapes and sizes and they have 
you know, their own perspectives, which is why someone like George Floyd can get killed at the hand of a police officer, but the ones that comes to the school, you know, um, who are doing their program or coming in for these community uh, programs, they're different. How do you explain that to a child? You know, this is like, th this cop is bad, but this cop is good. So yeah. you have to know at seven, which one to think, which one to be scared of and which one not to like and which one to trust. And I think those are, those are the challenges I think that we have to face. And so for, for, for you both, what advice would you have for other, you know, interracial couples who are trying to have conversations like you all, like you all are having with your friends and with your families to kind of bring, to, um, you know, two worlds together to have a deeper understanding of, of what's happening and how we can, how we can push for change? Well, I would say to try to be as frank as possible, like, yeah. like I, I don't want to, you know, go over Braden's head, but I, I want to be straight to the point. Like, hey, this could be dangerous if you do certain things. Like, don't, like, kids are smart. Like, my son and my daughter are both very intuitive. So mm -hmm. even if I'm not feeling my best, like, they'll pick up on that. So you, you have to, you have to trust your children that they understand. They may not understand the words you use, but they can understand and they can pick up on that fear or that worry that you have in your voice or in your body language. So I, I would say, you know, have those conversations. Like, and again, it, the difficult part is at what age is the right age? Like you said, yeah. your boy's seven, my son is eight. Like, when is too early? Mm -hmm. But you, you have to prepare them for the world that's outside. Like, for instance, my daughter, she's three years old. I try to have her routinely say, I'm smart, I'm beautiful, I'm powerful, I'm independent. So she may not know what those words mean, but that's going to be her mantra. So when she's a little older, she can finally put two and two together and she can truly believe that. So when she does step outside, she's, she's not as vulnerable. She is powerful. Yes, she looks different. Yes, she doesn't fit in with, you know, the women you see on TV or, or the, the models or the Western standard of beauty, but she's powerful. She's independent and just trying to instill these values in our children so that they can be prepared. And then when they're of a certain age, we can have you know, more detailed conversation with them, but we have to prepare them. And I, you know, I don't know if seven's too young or six is too young, but they have to know that there is a difference between black people and brown people. And until that changes, we have to be proactive rather than reactive. Mm -hmm. And Erica, how about you? What, what advice would you give for, for those, you know, not maybe not necessarily with children, but just a, an interracial couple who is trying to have um, you know, conversations that can be incredibly uncomfortable, particularly um, if they are unaware or willfully ignorant, you know, mm -hmm. willfully blind um, to, to what's happening in the world. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing that I would recommend is that you have to be willing to be introspective mm -hmm. and to sit with whatever discomfort may come your way from the realization that as a white person, you regularly participate in white supremacy and it benefits you every single day of your life. Mm -hmm. And coming to grips with that can be uncomfortable and it can be painful because it's this moment of like, oh shit, <laughs> like, the, like my, my partner is black and here I am benefiting from white supremacy every single day of my life and playing a role in it mm. whether consciously or, or unconsciously consciously you should probably not be in that relationship but that's that's beside the point i think you know coming to grips with that and not making it about you after that so you you come to grips with it you sit with it and you're like okay th this is this is how i've grown up this is this is my life now what am i going to do to dismantle it what am I going to do in my every single day life? Because it's not just you read one book. It's not mm -hmm. just you, you call one person out. You do this every day. And if you get tired, too bad. Because black folks are tired and been tired. Real tired. Yeah. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so I think it's just, it first has to start in internally. Like you have to sit with that and be okay with it in a sense. And know that just because you participate in it, have participated in, participated in it, have benefited from it, that doesn't inherently make you a bad person. If you acknowledge that and then don't do shit about it, that makes you a bad person. 
-hmm. but you need to acknowledge it and then move forward. And I think the next step from there, once you kind of acknowledge that within yourself is to then start picking off friends and family, quite honestly, Mm -hmm. um, and to bring them into that fold. Um, and it's a delicate, awkward process, but it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems that, you know, the thing that's keeping you, you know, obviously it goes beyond this. Um, but love is, is the foundation, it's the entry point for any relationship, right? Whether friends or otherwise, and particularly, you know, in an um, interracial relationship, love has to be um, incredibly strong and, and understanding. What, what would you say, if you had to finish this, this sentence, love is for you both, what would you, how would you finish that sentence? Um, I would say uncomfortable because if you love someone, um, you have to be willing to both be uncomfortable yourself with being vulnerable, um, and and putting it on the line, but you also have to, in that relationship, if you love someone, be willing to say to them, you're wrong and here's why. Um, So I'm specifically thinking about family and friends. Like if you love them, you won't stand idly by while they continue to make the same mistakes and commit wrongs against your other loved ones. Mm. Um, And so that's why I would say love is uncomfortable. How about you? I'd say love is challenging. It's... (laughs) It's, it's very challenging. It's, you know, you're putting yourself out there. There are so many ups and downs, ebbs and flows. And, you know, you, again, you have to be very vulnerable with whoever. If you love a family member, if you love a friend, if you love a partner, like you're putting yourself out there every day. But the challenge comes from being true to yourself, but also being true to that person. So I, I don't ever try to change who Erica is. She doesn't try to change who I am. If we have differences, we, we need to work together. And working through that, it's very difficult at times, but when you get through it, you're stronger. You know, like they say that the rose that rose through the concrete, right? And you, mm-hmm. that, that rose not easy, is it? Right, you know? right. That, that is very challenging. But once, you, once that rose pops through that concrete, hey, that's a special rose. That's a, that's a one in a billion rose. So I would say love is very challenging in, in all aspects, but it's, it's definitely worth it and it's definitely rewarding. Mm. Yo, I I am so happy that I had this conversation with y'all. Like, I, you know, I got a glimpse of of, of how y'all are, are 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 working through this the challenging times. Um, um, I really appreciate you being so candid and transparent with me tonight. Um, you know, I just want to end with um, Shimon. I love you, brother. I see you, man. And you know, continue to keep pushing, making those you know uncomfortable conversations happen with your friends and your family. Erica, I love you. I see you. You matter. You know, both. we need you just as much as we need anybody. We need you. We need you both. Um, and you guys continue. Please, please continue to build on your, your work and, and building on the community because, you know, we got to do it. If everybody does a little, nobody has to do a lot. Exactly. Right. And, and so um, one step, one day at a time. And, you know, eventually we'll, we'll see some change. Yes, man. I, hey, I appreciate that. I appreciate all the kind words. You know, I, always, I appreciate you. You know, I'm a, I'm a phone call. I'm a text away. Yeah. And, you know, hey, keep doing your thing, man. You know, I've been proud of you for years. So, you know, hey, keep doing your thing. And uh, to the people out there, if you want to join our community conversations, you know, you can reach me through Jay or uh, however you want to do it. But, yeah, we we do them every two weeks. You know, we're trying to, you know, build this thing out. And uh, that's, I'll leave it at that. But thank you, man. I really appreciate it. All right. Love y'all. Y'all have a good night. All right. Uh, You too, man. Stay safe. I will.